Hello everyone, I just accidentally performed a seven year long brewing experiment, but more on that after the intro. So my original plan for this experiment was only to take about two and a half years. But along the way, I had a kid, I moved to the farm, this pandemic thing happened, uh, and so everything got delayed. And this experiment ended up running a lot longer than I thought it should. But it turns out it was for the best because the longer time frame led to some really interesting results. And what this experiment was about was the potential use of metabisulfite, uh, such as uh, Campan tablets or potassium metabisulfite as a way of extending the lifespan of long-aged vintage beers, things like barley wines or imperial stouts. Because this took me so long, I decided to do a video instead of a blog post. It is going to be a bit longer of a video because I'm going to talk about some of the science before I get into the experiment itself. So I've included timestamps in the video description below and I'll also put a time card here uh, to let you know where you can jump to if you want to skip through to the meat of the experiments. But with that, let's get into the science. And I guess the first bit of science to talk about is actually what happens in the aging of these long-aged vintage beers. And really what's going on in these beers is a process of slow oxidation. And that slow oxidation does a few things to the beer, some of which we want and we, we want to keep, and some of which are negative. So the first thing to talk about is what actually happens in these long-aged beers. And really, when you get down to it, it's a process of slow oxidation, and that has good aspects and bad aspects. So there's things that occur that we want during this process. These beers tend to start off overly bitter, and a lot of those bittering compounds from the hops will oxidize and become flavorless over time. At the same time, some of the malt products in there will become oxidized, and they take on sweet flavors and nutty flavors and fruity flavors. And this creates beers, once aged properly, that have an appropriate balance of bitterness and sweetness. And that sweetness isn't just plain malt sweetness, it's a much more complex and interesting flavor, almost sherry-like or port-like in character. But bad things happen as well. So some of those oxidation processes will produce astringent flavors, cloudiness in the beer, and other undesired aspects. So when we're aging these beers, it's always a balance between getting enough oxidation to get those desired flavors and balance of flavors without going too far and getting into that realm where we start to have those unwanted and undesired compounds appear. So my interest in this actually came uh, from winemaking. And for those of you who've made wine, you'll know that you often add sulfites to wine. And that's really important because that's what allows the wine to age for long periods of time. But conventional knowledge at the time, and keep in mind this was before Brewlosophy ran their experiments looking at sulfites and highly hopped beers, was that this wouldn't work in beer. And that's because there's sort of a, a problem, if you will, when it comes to using sulfites in beer, at least based on conventional winemaking wisdom. So potassium metabisulfite looks like this molecule here. If you're looking at Campton, the potassiums, which are the K, are simply swapped out for sodium. Uh, but the main heart of the molecule, that disulfide molecule, remains the same. In water, at a relatively neutral pH, this will form something called the sulfite ion, shown here. If you have something with moderate acidity, you'll have the bisulfite ion, shown here. And in fairly acidic conditions, this will actually convert into the sulfur dioxide molecule, shown at the end. In winemaking, sulfur dioxide is what's generally thought of as being the important molecule because it is an antioxidant and it is also antimicrobial. So it'll inhibit the growth of bacteria and other undesired organisms as well as acting as an antioxidant. So this all seems great, but there is an issue with this. And the issue has to do with the way that these molecules interact with pH. So here you can see um, a graph of these different ion concentrations relative to pH. And you can see at a pH of seven, which is neutral, we have the mixture of sulfite and bisulfite. And it's not until we get down to fairly acidic pHs that we start to see sulfur dioxide. But if we plot over top of this, the typical pH of wine versus beer, 
you'll see that, that the uh, production of sulfur dioxide really only begins in wine pHs. So because of this pH effect, conventional knowledge would have us believe that metabisulfite shouldn't work in beer. The pH simply isn't low enough to make sulfur dioxide. But is that actually true? And the reason why I ask, is that actually true, is that sulfur dioxide is most important in wine for its antimicrobial effect. Beer is pretty stable in terms of microbes uh, once it's packaged, so it's not as much of a concern with beer as it is with wine, where particularly from the cork, you can often get organisms that'll negatively affect the wine. In fact, if anything, the less acidic pH of beer should actually promote uh, a longer lasting antioxidant effect. Let me explain. So at the pH of beer, the ratio between bisulfite and sulfur dioxide is going to be about 100 molecules of bisulfite for every molecule of sulfur dioxide. And that's probably an exaggeration. It's probably closer to a thousand to one. But what this means is if we lose some sulfur dioxide to off-gassing, there should be a huge pool of bisulfite, which can regenerate that sulfur dioxide. Likewise, if we have an oxidized molecule, which consumes that sulfur dioxide, the beer should again be easily able to regenerate more sulfur dioxide. So essentially we have a massive pool of molecules that can be converted into sulfur dioxide. And that small amount of sulfur dioxide that's present can go on and do its job. But there's more that may be beneficial here because the bisulfite itself may actually have antioxidant effects. So that brings us to how metabisulfite works. But before we get into that, we actually have to take a little side trip and talk a touch about oxidation. Now, many people have kind of a naive um, expectation of how oxidation works. They sort of think that you have oxygen, it gets into the beer, it reacts with molecules in the beer forming oxidized beer molecules. And that's actually wrong. It's a lot more complicated than that. So molecular oxygen that dissolves into the beer needs to be activated before it can start oxidizing things. And this activation requires the oxygen pick up an extra electron forming a superoxide ion or an O2 negative ion. Now that extra electron can be passed onto the oxygen by living organisms like yeast as part of their metabolism, but it can also be catalyzed by metal ions in the beer, meaning that that electron can be stripped off of one molecule and then through these ions be passed into the oxygen, again forming superoxide. Now at this point, one of two things can happen. Superoxide can react with protons, which is acidity, forming a hydroperoxyl radical. So this molecule has an unpaired electron and really wants to react with stuff. But actually more likely is that this molecule will pick up another electron, again, either donated from a cell or catalyzed across by something like uh, iron to form the peroxide ion. And now this peroxide ion uh, can react with, again, protons in the beer, forming hydrogen peroxide, or it can pick up another electron and go through a few extra steps to form a hydroxy radical. Now hydrogen peroxide in the beer usually won't last very long because it'll be converted by something called the Fenton reaction to form the hydroxy radical. And this is again catalyzed by iron ions within the beer. You can see that whether we go directly to the hydroxyl radical or indirectly to the hydroxyl radical that we've converged on the hydroxy radical. And really when we're talking about oxidation in beer, this is the molecule we're most concerned about. Now that's not the end of what this radical can do. So this radical can pick up another electron forming the hydroxide ion, which can then eventually be neutralized by reacting with a proton to form water. So there is an ultimate end to this pathway if, it, if something bad doesn't happen in between. But I'd like to point out that everything with a red box around it is something that can do something bad to our cells. It can react with molecules in our cell. So it's unlikely that we're going to neutralize this activated oxygen, and it's far more likely that we're going to damage something uh, in our beer with the ions that are radicals that are formed. So I'm not going to go through all of the hundreds of possible reactions. I'm just going to show you two examples of relatively common ones that kind of highlight how these molecules can work and also how one of these radicals can do an awful lot of damage.
So what we're looking at here is a, an unsaturated lipid. So this would be commonly found in beer. Uh, lipids are present in hops, they're present in the yeast. If, you're done a, if you've done a mixed fermentation, they're present in the bacteria. And these lipids are very sensitive to oxidation. In particular, the hydrogen atom that's next to the double bond is really prone to oxidation. So again, that hydroxyl radical, the one I told you is usually the problem, will basically rip that hydrogen right off of that lipid. This will neutralize the hydroxyl radical forming water, but it will also form a lipid radical. So now we have a lipid molecule that has an extra electron, and it does not want to have an extra electron. It wants to get rid of this thing. So that extra electron, which is shown here in the red circle, uh, can react with oxygen to form a lipid peroxyl radical. So basically, we still have a radical, but now it's attached to oxygen that's attached to the lipid. This can now react with another lipid, and two things happen. One is we're going to again rip off this hydrogen and form a lipid peroxide molecule. Uh, this lipid peroxide uh, is stable, but it's very unpleasant. It tastes rancid. But the thing to keep in mind here is we've ripped this hydrogen ion off of another lipid, which means we've just regenerated that lipid radical. So we now have a cyclical pathway where a single hydroxyl radical can oxidize, hypothetically, dozens, maybe even hundreds of lipids. Here's another example of this. Now, in this case, this is ethanol, the alcohol in the beer, again, reacting with that hydroxyl radical. Now, 85% of the time, the carbon closest to the uh, hydroxyl group is what's going to react, and again, the hydroxyl radical will strip off a hydrogen forming water, leaving behind, in this case, an ethanol radical. Now this is very unstable, almost immediately breaks down, forming acid aldehyde, as well as a hydroxyperoxyl radical. And we all know acid aldehyde, this is that unpleasant, underripe apple flavor or vegetal flavor that often appears in beer. Now in 15% of cases, the carbon farthest from the alcohol group will lose its hydrogen and form a radical. This molecule also is unstable and will quickly break down, but in this case it's going to form formaldehyde, which tastes unpleasant and is also fairly poisonous. Hydrogen peroxide, which if you recall can go back through the Fenton reaction to form more hydroxy radicals, the hydroperoxyl radical, and water. And so again, we formed a whole bunch of new oxidizing molecules, and this reaction can go on and on and on. And so again, one hydroxy radical can oxidize dozens or hundreds of alcohol molecules. This also happens to proteins and to quinones and all sorts of other chemicals present within beer. So this has both good effects and bad effects. So again, hop alpha acids tend to be oxidized causing a loss of bitterness. Now, when you design these beers properly, that's actually a desired trait because you usually brew them overly bitter so that as this occurs, they'll, bitterness will come into balance. Phenols and polyphenols, which are common in the husks of grain as well as in hops, uh, turn into, generally speaking, unpleasant molecules. These are things that can be astringent. They can create very cloudy beer. They can thin out the mouthfeel of the beer, just generally things you don't want in there. Sugars and dextrins are kind of the opposite. These are the things we actually want to oxidize. These will undergo Maillard reactions and they oxidize. So this will cause the beer to darken. You'll get caramel flavors and dried fruit flavors and nutty flavors coming out of this that can be quite pleasant. And when we have things like proteins and alcohols, the reaction products can be, are largely aldehydes in nature. Some of these are quite pleasant. They can be grainy and fruity and nutty but some of them are unpleasant. It can be grassy and vegetal, and that classic cardboard oxidized flavor is one of these products. So that's how oxidation works, but how does metabisulfite work? Well, if you look at a lot of brewing forums and even uh, some of these brewing books here, they'll tell you that metabisulfite will react with oxygen and eliminate the oxygen before it can cause damage. It turns out that's completely and utterly wrong. So again, this is that graph I showed you earlier, looking at how pH influences the relative amounts of the different ions that metabisulfite can form. Now it turns out that sulfite, the one that is only really present at neutral and basic pHs, 
can actually directly react with oxygen and neutralize it. So the SO3 two negative or the sulfite ion can react with molecular oxygen to form sulfate or SO4. But in beer and wine, there's none of this around. So this reaction doesn't really take place. So what happens? How does it work? It turns out it does a number of different things. And again, I apologize for this overly complex pathway, but a lot of what metabisulfite can do takes place in this pathway. So keep in mind that the original activation of the oxygen, as well as that Fenton reaction, require metal ions, things like iron uh, 2 plus and manganese 2 plus. Well, it turns out that these also like to react with SO2, so with uh, sulfur dioxide, and this will now form insoluble metal salts. And it's because they're insoluble, even if there's not enough of them to precipitate out, they're still inactive and will no longer act to oxidize the beer. But that's not all. The bisulfite ion can react with hydrogen peroxide to form uh, sulfate, and in doing so, reduces the hydrogen peroxide. This obviously shuts down that Fenton reaction and reduces the amount of hydroxyl radicals that are formed. We can also reverse some of the oxidative damage that occurs. So there's a lot of molecules in beer that contain uh, quinone and phenol groups, similar to this molecule here. And when oxidized, these molecules do become damaged and take on, again, astringent and otherwise unpleasant flavors. And you'll notice that this uh, oxidation reaction actually does a lot of damage to this molecule. It breaks a carbon double bond and it converts two hydroxyl groups into aldehyde groups. So a lot of damage has happened to this molecule. How could we possibly reverse that? Well, it turns out the bisulfide ion will react with those aldehydes to form this intermediary molecule, and it will then actually convert into um, sulfate, and in doing so, restore the original molecule. So it's not just preventing oxidation, but it's actually reversing the effects of oxidation. All right, so that's quite a bit. I hope it all made sense, but this finally brings me to my experiment, which is can I leverage these tools to allow for a long-aged beer to last longer and to have those desired characteristics for a longer period of time. So the concept behind this experiment is quite simple. Normally we would package beer, it would oxidize for a while and become nice, well-aged, delicious, vintage beer. But then as a little bit more time passes, the beer would stale and no longer be pleasant. The experiment was, what if I add some metabisulfite? Could we extend the time period where we have this well-aged desired beer and delay the onset of the beer staling. So again, the design of this, as I'm sure you can imagine, is pretty simple. I brewed up a classic and very simple English barley wine style recipe. I'll post the recipe here because I brewed it seven years ago. I don't remember the recipe. Uh, I fermented it and aged it for three months in bulk, at which point I bottled it and aged it for an additional three months before starting the tasting series. During the bottling time is, of course, where all of the important stuff happened. Now, of course, I recorded this on video when I did it. It was seven years ago. I've lost it. So I'm afraid some more crummy animations will have to fill in. So when I bottle long-aged beers, I use a pretty similar process to what I'm showing you here. So the first thing I do is I add about two mils of a one-to-one -one mixture of sugar and water. Uh, and this has obviously been sterilized so that I'm not introducing any bacteria. Then I added either two mils of water to the control bottles or two mils of water containing 10 milligrams per mil of metabisulfite. If you're curious how much that is in a five gallon batch, that's about 0.6 grams, which for those of you familiar with the brewlosophy experiments is about double what they use. I then fill this with beer from my kegging system, add a small amount of yeast to the top of the bottle, and cap. And as I said before, other than that addition of metabisulfite, this is how I normally bottle these long aged beers. And the reason I use this approach is that small amount of sugar and yeast should consume any oxygen introduced during bottling, and it also restores about 0.2 to 0.4 volumes of CO2 to the beer, so it also restores some of the carbonation that is lost when I bottle. Next up, I needed to randomize my samples. Uh, so the way I did this is I, I um, printed up a sticker sheet containing random numbers. I gave these to my wife and I asked her to stick, her on, stick them on the bottles and to just keep note of which bottle got which sticker. Uh, 
and to then take those bottles and place them into boxes in a random order. And then the list of which random number corresponded to metabisulfite versus water treated samples was put in a sealed envelope and thrown into the last box of beer. I also needed a scoring system so that I could somewhat objectively score the, the beers and the quality of the beers. And so I came up with this system here. It's a scale from one to five. So a score of one is just a young beer. It's overly bitter. There's none of that balancing oxidized character. It's just too young to drink. A score of two would be a beer that's just coming into that prime period. So the bitterness has come into balance and you're starting to get some of those Mallard products that have those nice flavors that we're looking for. A score of three is a beer right in prime. This is where all of those flavors are in a wonderful balance. Everything tastes great and none of those negative flavors are present at a level that they're a problem. A score of four is a beer that's past prime. So this is now where the beer is starting to get overly sweet because those Mallard products are becoming quite abundant and the hot bitterness compounds are being depleted. And that's also where you're starting to pick up some of those unwanted off flavors. The astringency from the, the oxidized polyphenols and the cardboard flavor from some of the other oxidized molecules. And A5 is undrinkable. This is where you have that hazy, watery, disgusting mess. Now I actually had a second scoring system set up, but it turns out I didn't need it because the other concern I had was that this would provide a sulfur aroma to the beer. Uh, so basically I would open each bottle and as soon as that bottle was opened, I would sniff the opening and see if I could detect any sulfur aromas. But not a single bottle from day one to the last day had a sulfur aroma. All right, so that brings me to the plan. And the plan was I would have beer six months old, again, three months in the fermenter, three months in the bottle, and then every two weeks I would drink one bottle, recording the score and the random number, and then two years later I could unblind the data and analyze it. What actually happened, of course, was a little bit different. I started off as I planned, and then, you know, kids, farms, other things, uh, and all of a sudden it was seven years later and I finally got to the last bottle. But turns out that was for the better, and so here we go. So this is the first bit of data. I'm just showing you the raw value, so the raw score is unblinded. Uh, and you'll notice early on, these dots are quite close together. They're all at the same score. But as time passes, we get more and more spread among these dots. But of course, the real thing of interest is what happens when we unblind. So here, the open circles are the control bottles, so the bottles that received water and the dark triangles are the balls that received the potassium metabisulfite. And again, you can see at early time points, everything is clustered together. You can't really tell them apart, but starting somewhere around the two to two and a half year mark, we start to see the water, so the control bottles, uh, moving up in score more quickly than the K-meta dosed bottles. And this persists and becomes even more dramatic as time passes. So I then analyzed this data to find the average time uh, at which each uh, group of bottles transition from one score to the next. And I think you'll notice here that fairly early on, there isn't a huge difference uh, in the timing of these bottles moving up through the scores, but later on there is quite dramatic differences in the timing of these bottles as they move through these different scores. But what's really interesting from this data is our information on drinkability and lifespan. So the first thing we can look at is at what point does the average bottle reach that early drinkable stage? Or in other words, when is a good time to start drinking these bottles? And what we actually find is there isn't a lot of difference. Um, both sets of bottles hit this point at roughly the two year mark. The next thing we can ask is at what time point does the majority of bottles uh, hit the undrinkable point, so the point where we've let them age too long. And here I think you can already appreciate there's a pretty dramatic difference. In fact, it's almost a two year difference between the control, which is the solid line, versus the dotted line, which is the, the metabisulfite treated bottles. But of course the real question is, what does this mean in terms of drinking period? What is that period of time where we can consume these bottles and know that we're getting something enjoyable? 
For control beers, this was about two years. So essentially you had to wait about a year and a half to two years before they were good to drink, and then you had two years to drink them. For the metabisulfite treated bottles, this was almost four years. So in other words, you had to wait again about two years before the bottles were ready to drink, but you then had four years to enjoy them. So essentially we doubled the amount of time that these bottles were good by adding a small amount of metabisulfite. So adding metabisulfite uh, really helps quite a bit. Um, the ratio I used was uh, 0.1 grams of metabisulfite for every four liters of beer, or in other words, about 0.1 grams per gallon. Now what really surprised me is there wasn't really an effect of the metabisulfite on how long it took for the beer to get to that stage where you would want to start drinking it, right? It took two years whether or not the metabisulfite was present, but quite dramatically, it had a huge effect on how long that beer remained in that period where it was good to drink, right? We doubled that period of time just by adding a bit of metabisulfite. And I didn't really have a way to present it here, but my tasting note on the different flavors I was picking up also didn't really change. The same caramel and sort of date-like fruit flavors came out. I also got a very, very similar uh, nutty flavor that came out over time. And even when it started to go into astringency, those off flavors that formed also were quite similar. So the, the flavor profile really wasn't changed, it's just how long you could enjoy it for. Anyways, that's the experiment that accidentally took seven years to conduct. I think it was really quite interesting, and this is actually something I'm now doing in all of my vintage beers. It really has a positive effect, no apparent negative effects. And I think I'm gonna be doing this for as long as I continue to brew these. I hope you found that interesting, and I'll see you next time.